Good evening, everyone. My name is Josh, and I'm the program coordinator with Global Connections. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's program, Cinco de Mayo, with Chef Jamie Callison. Chef Jamie is a part of the WSU School of Hospitality Business Management here at WSU's Carson College of Business. We're here tonight to give you a little festive feast in preparation for next week's Cinco de Mayo. So without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Chef. Sure. Well, welcome to our kitchen here. We're very excited to have you. Um, tonight we're going to be doing, this is one of my family's favorite meals, so this is going to be a lot of fun for me. And, uh, uh, Brittley Barrett, who's my culinary lead here, she's going to be assisting me. And then Travis Odell is going to be doing the margaritas at the end to kind of close everything off. And so we're going to go right to cooking. So we're going to start with making uh, homemade tortilla chips. Um, not making the homemade tortillas, but the chips. Very important before you, um, when you go to the store, that you buy the extra thin tortillas. Uh, you want to. Um, Always start with those because if you get the real thick ones, they're not going to cook all the way through. So it's very important to get the, the thin ones. Um, when I was first um, married, my wife was amazed that you can actually make homemade um, uh, tortilla chips. The quality difference, it makes a huge difference. And um, we're using a fryer here. And the nice thing about using a fryer is it controls the temperature too. So we're going to cut these. And we're going to cut them into six pieces. And we're just going to take them now, just a small amount, and we're going to drop them into our fryer basket. And it's important uh, when you first put them in there that you mix them around. So, and the reason being is because if you don't do that, they'll stick together, and you end up with um, raw um, tortilla chips in between. So we're going to cook these. I'm going to stir these around um, while we're cooking them. And we're going to do that so that we could, um, we'll kind of listen for a little bit of a crunch. Um, uh, it's kind of sounds weird because you're here in the fryer, but we want to kind of listen to the chips that are making a sound when you're hitting them next to each other. They're going to turn a little bit um, golden in color, but you don't want to get them too dark because you don't want to create a bitterness. It's hard to hear the, the sound, but you definitely kind of hear a little crunch when you put them in there. You do not want all the oil to be removed. And the reason being is you want a little bit of oil on the chips so the salt will stick to it. And we're just going to take them and shake them like that. And if you can see, there's no oil on the bottom, so they're not oily, but they're nice and crunchy. And that salt has now stuck to them. So now that we have our chips made, we're going to start uh, making our salsa. More of a pico de gallo type salsa. Uh, what we want to start with is really fresh tomatoes. When you're uh, making a salsa, you want to actually, it sounds strange, you want to walk through the store and you want to look at the tomatoes, but also smell them. If it doesn't smell like a tomato, you probably shouldn't use it. Um, unfortunately, most of our tomatoes um, grown this time of year or, or during the winter are picked very green. So I always look for the, the vine ripe, even though it's not perfect. Um, they're still picked somewhat green, but the vine still gives it some of that fresh tomato flavor. So here we have our wonderful local sweet onions. We have our jalapenos. We have garlic and cilantro. When you're preparing these items, for your lime, all of our vegetables and stuff, we make sure we wash first. Before you juice a lime, we like to roll it back and forth on the cutting board. And what that's doing is that's loosening up all the juice inside. And especially, sometimes limes now are costing, this year, there were times where they cost $2 a piece. You want to make sure you get all the flavor and all the juice out of these limes that you possibly can. We're going to cut them in half this way. And then basically, just use one of these juicers and we're going to kind of squeeze around it and turn. And that's going to give us our nice lime juice that we're going to use in our salsa. Jalapenos, um, same thing. We wash these. Um, 
you have to be very careful. I always recommend to wear gloves um, when you're cutting jalapenos. And what we do is we're going to be careful not to cut through the middle, the membrane, and the seeds. That's where all the spice is. It's also very important when you're um, using jalapenos to try them. Different times of year and different regions that they come from, there's going to be different spice levels. So basically what we're doing right now is we're cutting kind of sheets off the side and trying not to come in contact with too many of the seeds. What I do then, before you go too far into cutting up the jalapeno is you really have to make a judgment of how much you're going to want to use. And really this should taste more like a green pepper um, with a little bit of spice to it. There's times where this little piece of um, uh, jalapeno will be so spicy that it would be too much for a whole batch of salsa. It just depends on the time of year. Most of your heat comes from in here. And what we would do with this is if you're going to use this and you want to add some heat to your salsa, um, you'd want to make sure that you slice it and then you dice it more, well, chop it into a paste. And the reason we do that is so that when you're adding the spice to it, you don't get a big chunk of seed or the white membrane, which would be overly spicy. You kind of get a nice balance of the spice in there. So what we're going to do with these now, we have these strips. What I usually do is um, I have my students taste them. Really, do you want to taste? She turned me down on that. So uh, This summer, I was making, uh, so we're going to cut them into julienne strips, and then we're going to cut them into a, a really small dice like that. This summer, I made a batch of salsa. I've been buying the jalapenos, made a bunch of salsa. I, it's great to eat it during the summer. And I actually bought one, I put one jalapeno in it because I was making it for my daughter's friends. And I didn't test, and I only put the green part in there. And it was actually so hot that I couldn't use it. So it was, um, it was very unfortunate. I actually, there was no saving it. It was so hot, so I had to actually start all over again. Um, so I definitely recommend always trying that product. Now the fun part. And of course, um, at home, you're going to have to go through a little bit more work than what I'm doing here. Uh, but I have all my, what we call mise en place, everything in its place. We have our tomatoes. We have our jalapenos here. Our diced onion. And the nice thing is as you're, um, you start making homemade salsa or pico de gallo for your family, they will tell you how much they, how small they want their onions diced and so on. So you can adjust to that. We have our garlic, cilantro, and lime juice. And so now we have all of our ingredients in here. We're going to add some salt, and we're going to mix this together. It's a lot better if you uh, mix your salsa at least four hours ahead of time. And that's what we can call is melting all the flavors together. You want that garlic flavors to come out, the oils from the garlic. You want the cilantro flavors to come out. If you make the salsa and you serve it right away, you're going to get kind of spotty flavors. But if you let it set in the refrigerator for at least four hours, sometimes overnight, all those flavors are going to meld together and you get a more balanced um, product. You can see we have beautiful color. And in this dish, the sweetness from the tomatoes, the spiciness from the jalapenos, the kind of crunch from the onion, that cilantro flavor, all those flavors come together to, to give you that balance that, that people enjoy. Now we're going to go to my favorite salsa. It's tomatillo um, uh, salsa verde. So what I've done is I've taken my tomatillos, I've grilled them. You can peel them. What I always do is I kind of uh, test them to see how soft. Sometimes the skin is really, really hard. What you can do is you can put them over a, a grill or an open fire, roast them off. You can even roast them off in your oven and then peel off the skin. These skins were actually really tender, so I just used them. So I, didn't, I just blended them up. So what I did was I took my, all my tomatillos, rough chopped them, and I just put them in a um, food processor. And I didn't um, blend it till it was totally smooth. I wanted some texture. But I ended up with this nice mixture right here. And this is just tomatillos to start with.
So to make this one a little bit more exciting, um, I took all the pulp and the seeds and I minced those up. I feel that when you eat a uh, salsa verde, it should have a little kick to it. So I'm gonna add that in, probably not all of this, just because um, some of the film crew may want to eat this later. I have my cilantro here. Lime juice. And jalapenos. I know this looks like a lot of jalapenos. However, um, these really taste more like a bell pepper until you add in the seeds and the pulp. So now we're gonna mix this together. And if you can see that beautiful color, And we have our salsa verde. The salsa verde, I, it's really important um, so you don't get those really hot spots in there. To make your salsa verde, I, I would say it, 24 hours in advance and those flavors are gonna really meld together. Uh, but this is definitely my, my favorite salsa. So we have our, um, uh, we're gonna make guacamole now. And guacamole is really one of my favorite, um, I keep on saying my favorite, but it's, it's, I always talk about when I teach my students about cooking, I talk about tasting. I mean, that's why I stay so skinny because I have to taste everything. Um, you, you need to taste things. And, and as I've kind of eaten more and more um, guacamole, what I've realized is for a lot of dishes, I really like to keep it very simple. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick a good avocado. A little trick to cutting an avocado is just taking your knife and kind of rolling it like this so you're able to pull it apart. What some people do, and this is a little, I teach my students a little safety um, trick. Some people will take the um, seed and hold the, hold the avocado like this. That's very dangerous because you can cut through it. What I always do is I go like this, like this, and then inside of your cutting board, just flip it off like this. And that is, um, keeps it really safe. I know I probably did that a little fast, but when you roll the, um, you're able to get the seed off there. Um, a lot of people cut themselves trying to pull the seed off with their, um, with their hand, and this is really slippery. Chef, quick question. Yes. Uh, we would like to know, what is a tomatillo? It's a green um, tomato from, uh, yeah, it's just, it's a, and it has a lot more acidity to it. So you definitely have to um, be careful what you're using it for and, and kind of taste it. And I like to roast it off a little bit and it gets rid of some of that raw green tomato flavor and it really adds a lot to the salsa. So what I'm gonna do with um, avocado, I like to just kind of quarter it and pull if, the, if it's ripe, you can just pull the skin right off of it. So what I was getting to, and I, I kind of stopped what I was saying, but what I'm getting to with um, guacamole is tonight we're gonna be showcasing fajitas. So um, I, the fajitas have a lot of flavor and I want something that has a nice mellow flavor to it and complements the dish. People add all kinds of fun stuff to their guacamole, and I do too. If you're making it for just chips and salsa, add jalapenos to it, red onions, tomatoes, all different types of, of uh, ingredients. If I'm making it to complement a dish that already has a lot of flavor, I want something that's fresh. And so what I'm gonna do today is I'm just gonna add salt and lime juice, and that's it. Uh, we had a, a event here last week, and people kept on coming up and saying, what's your recipe for guacamole? And I said, mush up your uh, avocados, add salt and lime juice to taste and enjoy. And they thought I was crazy, but that's um, what I like to do. So what I do here is I'm just taking the round part of the spoon and just pushing against the edge or the, the bowl, because it's curved too. And the nice thing I like doing it this way instead of in a mixer is I can look in there and I can tell exactly what the texture is of the uh, avocado and how chunky it is. I like mine a little bit more chunky. My daughter um, likes it a little um, less chunky, so if you like it really, really smooth, you can put it in a mixer with a paddle attachment, and that works really well to get it smoothed out. So I have a nice consistency. There's still some chunks in here. If I'm serving, the, and these avocados are really good right now, if I'm serving really nice avocados, I want to showcase them and leave some pieces in there. I'm going to add a little bit of salt and a little bit of my lime juice. 
I'm going to mix this up. And that's, that's finished. Um, the beauty of guacamole and what I was getting to earlier is I teach my students to taste. And one of the tastes that really kind of, when you go out to dinner or you, you make a nice dinner with proteins are, is salt, fat, acid. The beauty thing about this, about this uh, guacamole is we have the fat from the avocado, salt, I put a little kosher salt in there, and the lime juice. And, and you really don't need anything else. And so that's, um, especially when you're um, serving with other items, it really helps complement those things. To keep um, guacamole um, from turning, I have heard, you know, put the pit back in it. Um, I have tried that, it has never worked for me. Maybe I'm doing it wrong, but some people will take the pit and put it right back in there. The only thing that really works that helps is actually taking a piece of plastic wrap and pushing all the air out and pushing it down so that there's no way for air to get in there. Every once in a while, the air will still get in there. And if your guacamole is two, three days old, a lot of times you can just scrape that, um, the brown part off and you still have this great guacamole underneath. So now we're going to, um, we're covering a lot of things um, tonight, so please um, send in some questions and stuff, we'll kind of, we'll answer some questions too. Um, the wonderful thing about this meal is there's so many different flavors and, and different things going on here. So we're going to go to Spanish rice. Um, I do want to give some credit to uh, people I've, I've learned this from in industry. I've worked with a lot of um, different cooks. And I worked with, uh, in Seattle, I worked with a lady and her name was Flora. And she just was one of the most amazing cooks. And so I ran specials of her food and stuff all the time. And what I learned is um, in, all over Mexico, there's different regions. And so one of the things that people think is really strange is I put um, carrots in my Spanish rice. Um, and people think that's crazy, but that's the region that she was from. They used carrots in her Spanish rice. I loved her Spanish rice, so I put carrots in my Spanish rice and it brings me back to that memory. And that's what makes food a lot of fun is you're, you're going back to memories, whether your childhood, friends, family, workplaces, and food kind of brings all that together. So what I did was I added some oil in here. And um, in um, Mexico, a lot of times they'll use bacon grease or pork drippings, and that adds extra flavor to your um, rice. However, um, we have vegetarians and, and, and different things, so I kind of like usually making my rice um, vegetarian or um, with, without the pork. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sweat the carrots out. And basically sweating means to saute without browning. So we're going to um, sweat these out and we're going to cook them until they're translucent. And then we're going to add in the rice. And what we're going to do with the rice is we're going to, we're going to cook it a little bit so that it, um, we're going to coat it with oil, but we're also going to cook it a tiny bit without browning it. And what that does is that creates a coating on the rice so that when it cooks, it doesn't get mushy and just totally disintegrate. Uh, we are not making rice aroni though, so we want to make sure that we do not brown um, the rice. Nothing wrong with rice aroni, but that's not what we're doing today. So our carrots are just about done. They don't take very long because I cut them really small. I didn't want big chunks of carrots and my rice. So I'm going to add my rice to this. Now I'm just going to cook this a little bit until I, it, you really have to listen for things, until I hear kind of a little bit of a popping sound. And when I hear that popping sound, that means that that rice is getting a little bit toasted. But again, I want to really watch that I don't get any color on this rice. What I have done here is I have a mixture here of um, one and a half cups, and then today I'm using, um, you can use vegetable stock, today I'm using chicken stock. And then I put a half a cup of tomatoes, garlic, onions blended up. And what, if I was in a restaurant that was serving Spanish rice, we'd just take the scraps from the tomatoes and all those things, blend them up, and that creates a base and the flavor. What they put in their rice too a lot is um, uh, Sazon Goya. It's a flavoring packet, it adds color, but also it's kind of like a bouillon cube, but not. It adds color and a little bit of flavor. So I'm, I added a little bit of that to um, my mixture here. So I have this is hot. So I'm just going to take this and pour over my rice mixture. 
And then I'm going to bring this to a, uh, the boiling point. And then I'm going to put it in the oven at about 225 degrees for about 25 minutes. And then basically when it's done, we're going to pull it out. We're going to um, take a fork, kind of loosen it up, and taste it for salt and serve it. That's just about ready. We want to make sure also that we get all the rice from around the edges here. Because if you get rice that's stuck up here and as the rice cooks and it rises, it's going to pick up that raw rice and you're going to have that crunch, um, I guess, an expensive dental bill. You're going to have rice that's uncooked and it's going to be um, very um, unpleasant to eat. All right. So what we're going to do next is one of my, I keep on saying, one, this is just my favorite dinner. I keep on saying one of my favorite things. Um, everything that we're doing here, uh, my family sometimes would request this once a week, sometimes during the summer, twice a week. It's just a lot of great flavor. So what we're going to do here is we're going to um, make chili verde. This is basically a stewing process. So we're going to take the pork. I've seasoned this a little bit with just a little bit of salt. A little bit of oil on there, and I put a little bit of oil in here. Um, I've pre-cooked some of the pork, and we normally would not do this. Um, I've browned some of the pork. What we normally want to do is we want to build flavors in here. So we want to, on kind of medium heat, we want to brown the pork, remove it, and you don't want to add too much. This is probably maximum amount for the size pan. If you add too much, you're just going to steam it. We want to get a little bit of color on that pork. So we're going to cook this. And if, as you can see in the pot, it's not overly crowded. If it was stacked on top of each other, you'd steam it instead of browning it. So we're going to get a little bit of color on this. And what we want to do, as we're removing the pork as it gets cooked, and we add in the other ingredients, we're going to start building flavors, just like a stew. You do not want to saute um, everything on the side and add it together. You want one pot cookery. And why would you want to wash all those dishes anyway? If you can cook a great dinner in one pot with very little work, it can be pretty amazing. Give me a tongue. So we're going to brown the meat. And like I was saying earlier, you want to be really careful when you're doing this. Um, not to have this too high of heat because if it's too high of heat, you're going to get burnt spots in there and you're going to get a bitter flavor. So you want medium heat. Don't over um, fill the pan and that way you're not steaming the items. So here I have my diced onions. I have a little bit of cumin and oregano. More jalapenos. A little bit of tomatillo. Um, with the, all the peppers I'm putting in here, I don't like to have too much because it gets a little too acidic of flavor and a little bit of garlic. In here, this looks like a lot, and it is. I have all my green chilies. Um, these have been roasted and basically burnt and then the, put in a bag and then the skin um, taken off. It basically steams the skin off and you just use a knife and, and pull that off. Um, they sell really good products, um, store-bought um, green chilies at the store and you just buy the, um, the roasted green chilies and they'll have the skin off and they have great flavor. And they're sold at any store in the um, ethnic aisle. So right now we're doing a little bit of a saute here. We're gonna get a little bit of color on here. And I also have my chicken stock. I love that sound, that kind of sizzling sound um, and that you can't smell, we don't have smell vision yet, but just the smell of the caramelization of the proteins and pretty soon the caramelization of the onions. So 
So normally I would brown the meat just a little bit more, um, just due to uh, time frame of wanting to watch the chef um, brown the meat. Usually we're looking for color more in that, that color range right there. But we're getting some good color here in our pan. So now I'm gonna add my onions. And I diced these really small and I did that on purpose because all this is gonna be blended together. There's no reason for me to stand here at the stove for a long time. We add the jalapenos in here too, right along with the onions. And the nice thing is the moisture from the onions, it deglazes the pan a little bit. So if you're starting to get some spots in your pan that are looking a little too dark, this is gonna pick up some of those flavors, the flavoring, and in the bottom of the pan, you can see the, the brown right here. Well, we wanna get some of that off as we're cooking the onions and then start to caramelize those onions. And again, that's the building of the flavors and a, a better way to say it, maybe it's a layering of the flavors that we're trying to create here. And you get that depth of um, incredible onions and jalapenos and and the pork so now we're going to add our tomatillos in here and we're going to let these brown for a little bit here So uh, we're gonna use for this as a handheld blender. And we're gonna use this to um, blend up all the, the peppers that have already been cooked. I'm cooking my onions and stuff right now. And what I'm, I'm gonna do is I'm gonna blend the liquid and everything before I put the meat back in. Cause we're gonna put the meat back in here and it's gonna cook for about two hours. Originally I was taught to put the meat in here with the, with the peppers and everything and then pull the meat out and blend it. And two years ago, I was demoing this exact same thing for my students. And I was like, why in the world am I doing that? So I just cook this liquid, this mix a little bit more, blend it, add the meat in. And then when I pull the um, pork out of the oven, it's done and I just season it for salt and pepper. We always wanna add a little bit of salt in the cooking. Um, unless your chicken stock is um, a store-bought chicken stock um, that has salt in it. And then definitely do not add any salt in the cooking. And the reason we don't want to do that is because as it reduces and uh, you get the, the liquid reduces, you're, it's going to get saltier. Right now I'm using homemade chicken stock and so there is zero salt in this, um, in this chicken stock. So I'm going to want to add just a tiny bit of salt to start with and the reason I'm doing that is it's going to help build the flavors um, and, and get them kind of melted together. And I'm going to want to season the chili verde at the very end. I'm going to pull out the other chili verde. It's done. So what we have here is we have the finished product. And this is the um, chili verde. And all I did when it came out was I tasted it, added some salt to it, and it's ready to go. The wonderful thing about chili verde is you can serve it with just rice, some beans, tortillas, and eat it just as is. Or you can make a burrito with it. Um, I, I like eating it just in a big bowl. It definitely has the, just a wealth of flavors. And it's, uh, again, I'm saying everything's my favorite, but this is definitely one of my favorites right here. All right, so I've gotten a little bit of color on my vegetables here. So now I'm gonna add in my garlic. Very important not to add garlic in at the beginning. Garlic has a lot of sugar. Garlic will burn if you add it in too early. So we wanna add it in just long enough to release the oil in the garlic. Uh, because if you, I know you've probably eaten something before and you had little black specks and then you could taste that bitter garlic it really leaves an off flavor. So we want to make sure that the garlic's added in at the very end. And then you cook it for anywhere from 30 seconds to a minute with that oil. And that's going to release the, the, the uh, oil in the garlic and, that, and get rid of that raw garlic flavor, but not enough to add any color to the garlic. 
So now I have my cumin and my oregano here. Oh, how I wish you could smell this right now. now all, the, all the aromas of the onions and everything are, are coming through. We're gonna add in our chicken stock. I know with our engineering department, they'll come up with smell vision or something soon. So that'll be a, a good thing for the Food Network. So we have all our peppers. It seems like a ridiculous amount of peppers. However, it's, it's, it's what really builds that great flavor. So we're gonna add that in. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna blend this. The peppers are already cooked, so we really don't need to wait. And these little handheld mixers are great. And the one thing you'll wanna do is you wanna make sure you don't blend this. Um, a lot of people will try to use a, um, uh, uh, regular blender and they'll blend it really smooth. You want some texture to remain with the chili verde. Again, at the end of the day, it's how your family likes it. If they all like it really smooth, make it really smooth. If they like it really chunky, then make it chunkier. It really is, becomes, um, I always say that I'm always right, but I'm not. It's really how people like it. Um, so your family may decide you don't want it blended at all and just things chopped up more. So I definitely like to keep some texture in here. I had somebody come up to me the other day at an event and ask for their steak cooked more. And um, Brittley's gonna demo steak here in a second. And they apologized to me. And you know, they always say chefs get mad when you order a well done steak. That's not true, uh, well, some chefs do. It really should be that we wanna produce things the way people like them. And so, even in your house, asking, um, family members and, and really trying to create recipes that your family likes, talking about them and creating things that um, have great flavor for you. And don't be afraid to, to restaurants. Um, if a chef gets mad for you ordering uh, beef the right the way that you want it, and then they probably should um, look at a different field because we're here to make people happy. Chef, will you comment on the spice level of the chilies? Um, actually, this is pretty mild. This is, um, give me a spatula. This is, um, it does have a little bit of a kick to it. This will definitely be something that will, will be a little spicier, but they're not, I mean, you could definitely use a serrano pepper or something in there and spice it up. And again, that's where I'm going, when I was talking about, make sure that when you're creating recipes and, and, and testing recipes, even this recipe, which is, I, I think, really good, you're gonna want it maybe a little bit spicier or a little bit less spicy. So add those other things in, take a jalapeno and mince it up and add some of that pulp in there if you like it spicier. All right, so I'm a, um, now I'm gonna hand this over to um, Brittley, and she's gonna talk a little bit about our, um, uh, the beef for a fajita. All right, hi everyone. Um, so I'm just gonna jump right into it and get started talking about our sous vide machine, which is our favorite new toy here at Catering. Um, it's a method of cooking that's a sort of uh, immersion cooker. So essentially, the sous vide machine here, temperature regulates this water bath. Um, so you could put any type of meat in there. Here we have uh, one of the pieces of meat for the fajitas tonight. Um, vac vacuum sealed with whatever marinade you want. So when it's cooked, um, you just toss it in, and, or to cook it, you just toss it in and um, set it at whatever temperature. We have it at 128 degrees here to get it uh, about rare to medium rare. And um, you let it sit. And the beauty about this is that you can let your uh, meat or whatever you're cooking cook as long as you want because as long as uh, it stays at the same temperature which it should as you set it um, it will never get overcooked and um, I'll explain a little bit later the difference between that and just conventional grilling and um, baking is that uh, it doesn't it won't get well done around the outside and then just medium rare on the inside the entire thing will be medium rare as well as the, all the juices and all of the marinade that you keep inside will all be um, incorporated into the meat and it just, we love it. We use it for everything. So um, another thing I'm gonna talk about, we're really proud here at WSU about our beef and our uh, organics farm. We use a lot of them here ourselves um, to brag about it. Uh, 
here we have WSU Wagyu beef. This here isn't Wagyu beef, but most of the events that we use is. And Wagyu is a breed of cow that's the same as Kobe beef. It's just raised a little differently. And um, at WSU, we feed them with a lot of local grains to uh, help their flavor. So we give them lentils, corn, um, stuff like that. So it's just a little bit different than your regular beef. And it's very high quality, wonderful marbling, all of that. So um, for the meat, meat for the fajitas today, it's marinated in a mixture of cumin, granulated onion, granulated garlic, salt, pepper, uh, and just oil. So we're gonna start by grilling it. It's sous vide here for about two and a half hours, I believe. So it should be about medium rare on the inside. But you can see how it's still really tender. Um, it's, it's perfectly all the way done throughout the middle. So we really just need to mark it to give it a little bit extra flavor on the top. So I have my hot, funny little grill here and I'm gonna explain the 10 and 2 so whenever you go to a restaurant or grill yourself and you see like the wonderful uh, beautiful grill diamond marks on it it's a lot easier than you'd imagine and now you can go home and impress all of your friends at your barbecue by having perfectly cooked steaks and burgers so I'm gonna start it at 10 o'clock or 10 o'clock for you guys and let it sit for a little bit and the, um, the grain here is gonna make the marks that we want it's pretty hot, so it shouldn't be on there for that long. Depends on how you like it, the uh, darker it is, the more flavor it gets. But since this is all the way cooked through, we don't want to have it sitting on for very long, which is why the, uh, the hot plate is very, very hot. So it just creates the mark. So if you can see this here, see the marks on the bottom? So I'm just going to flip it to two now. And then that's what's going to create the perfect diamond. So I'll do that on both sides. And behind me, Chef is cooking the uh, meat that we didn't sous vide, so you'll be able to see the difference between um, the methods and how it changes the, the look and the texture of the beef here. So when it's about equally dark on both sides, I'll flip it over to the other sides. It's also important when you're doing this um, to oil the top uh, in, in the bottom before you grill it so it doesn't stick. But at the same time, as I learned last week cooking fajitas, uh, if you have too much oil on it and you stick it on the grill, it'll flame up and burn off your eyebrows. Mine aren't burnt, but that's the idea. Um, so you want enough oil just to lightly coat it so it won't stick, but not too much that um, it'll drip into the grill and cause a fire. So once we get some marks, Chef here is going to um, cut it for us, but uh, you, in, in terms of cutting it, it's important to know whether to cut or where the grain is to make sure that you cut against the grain. So you kind of look through and you can see, um, it's hard to see here, but the grain, it's the lines on the beef, which way it runs. So you can almost see here um, the lines, how they're vertical like this. If you cut with them, so if you cut along those lines, it'll be really difficult to chew because of the connective, the connective tissues well, um, uh, they need to be severed by cutting it against the grain in order for it to create that um, more uh, tender and um, easier chewing bite of meat. So that's all from me. Thank you, brother. You're welcome. Uh, I love it when our when our students become the teachers, and it just uh, makes me really proud. And really, is uh, I. I think a lot of times she's better than me. She gets so excited um, when she gets when she gets to do these things. She's like, you know, a lot of times she just looks at me and says, "Chef, I got this," <laughs> and that, that's wonderful. So uh, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna let the meat rest a little bit, and it's important to let the meat rest a little bit. Um, when we sous vide it, it's less important. When you're cooking protein, basically all the muscle tissue and everything kind of pulls together, and so um, when you right when you pull it off the grill, you let it relax. And you know when you cut into a steak and it kind of bleeds all over the plate. That's because it hasn't rested. So it's really important to let it rest. So on the flank steak, which I think is the best um, fajita meat, uh, it really works well for grilling, you can, see, you can see the grains going across here. So we can, um, and really did a really good job of grilling it just perfect so you can still see them. You can see the grains kind of going like this. We want to make sure with this meat that we cut Basically, you look at this meat, that's perfectly medium rare all the way through. You see how we don't have that graying at all? That's, that's cooked perfect. So we have the grain here. Very important to cut 
against um, the grain, so cutting through the grain. And I'll kind of show you when I cut with the grain, same cut of meat, you, I can't pull this apart. I mean, it's starting to pull apart, but it's really hard. See how easy that is? And so the, um, trying to eat this would be impossible. So you buy this great meat and you go through all this work and then you cut it wrong and you can't, it's very unenjoy, unenjoyable to eat. So we're gonna cut this at a slight angle. Get me out of bowl. Put it in. And we cooked it at 128 today with the sous vide machines. Um, 128 is that perfect medium rare. Um, if you can see it, if you you can take it up to 130. A lot of times for events, we'll take it up to 130, and you get more kind of in between the medium and medium rare. But it's absolutely um, amazing um, product. So. Now I'm gonna go over grilling the um, peppers and then we're gonna go into the margaritas, which I know you're all waiting for. So for our, um, our vegetables, and I, uh, we always start with just a little bit of oil, hot pan, and we talked earlier about sweating. Sweating is sauteing without browning. Well now we're actually sauteing. Very important, onions and peppers cook differently, they have different sugar contents. If you put them together, the onions will burn and the peppers won't be done. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna cook them separately. And that sound that you hear, that's what you should hear. And if you look in the pan, it's not overcrowded. That's very important. So same thing with the onions. And when you're sauteing, I know a lot of people say, oh wow, I could never do that turn that I just did. Saute pans are angled. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the product and really you can, you can move product without even picking up the pan. You get the product down there and you just do a flip over like this. And we're gonna cook these till they get really good color on them. And then we may, we have extra peppers here. We'd remove these, put these on a warm plate, cook the peppers, the rest of the peppers and we're gonna mix everything together at the very end. So these are gonna cook for a few minutes and then we save a little bit of our marinade here and then after the vegetables are done we're going to add that marinade to our, um, to our vegetables. And at home when I make this for a big group I'll do the same thing with mushrooms and that's a great option for vegetarians um, to have those mushrooms in there because our, and have that separate from the beef because that gives um, kind of that meaty flavor um, for the fajitas. So if you want to practice this at home um, by all means what I would recommend is get a dry piece of toast cook a piece of toast to almost burnt, put it in a saute pan and keep on trying to flip it over. And if you practice, just like with knife skills or anything, if you practice, you will become um, really, you'll look like a professional sauteing. And that, that's easy for me, but at home that may look impressive if you're showing your friends, right? So are we ready for Margaritaville, Travis? All right. Yeah, we can move. So uh, uh, Travis came to us from um, South Fork and he um, wanted to come in and, and talk a little bit about uh, margaritas tonight because with this great um, food, it's a great compliment for the, the type of food that we're serving here tonight. So like Jamie was saying, um, it's various regions in uh, Mexico, um, tequila. Uh, comes out of a particular region. Um, tequila is made from 100% uh, agave. Um, sometimes you'll see uh, tequila is made not from 100%. If you look at the bottle here, um, they're mixed with uh, other like um, alcohols, um, like maybe a vodka or something. Um, it really backs off the robust flavors of the uh, the agave. Um, so we're just going to whip up a, a, a non-alcoholic margarita so you can enjoy these with uh, underage people as well as adults. So we're going to fill our glass here, mixing glass, with uh, some ice. Oh, goodness. 
this. So, forgot my salt here. Um, some pretty nice little products. Uh, this is Jose Cuervo's margarita salt. Uh, you can also just use plain kosher salt. Um, so we're gonna take our margarita glass. We're gonna rim it with the lime, coat the edge with juice and then dip it in our salt to get a nice salt color on our glass. Voila. Um, so the original margarita was just tequila, lime juice, and triple sec, which is an orange uh, liqueur. It's very sweet. Uh, so since we're not gonna be using uh, the triple sec, uh, we're gonna just buff it up with some simple syrup. Um, so if you go lime, just straight lime juice, it ends up being very tart. So we're also going to use some lemon juice. Uh, now I pre-squeezed uh, lemons and limes. Um, the fresher the juice, the better. Um, but there are also store-bought products that you can go for that are still delicious. Uh, but if you want a just a really nice, fancy, fantastic margarita, go with fresh fruits. Um, so I've got my jigger here. So this is a one ounce and half ounce jigger. Uh, we're gonna use it just to measure our product. So I'm gonna start with the lime juice. We're gonna go two ounces of lime juice. One ounce of lemon juice. And then we're gonna use uh, two and a half ounces of simple syrup. So, like I said earlier, the uh, triple sec is an orange liqueur. So, since we're lacking that orange, we're just going to give it a little squeeze of orange. Tap on our shaker. You want to shake it up very well. Um, lemon juice, all the citrus juices aerate when shaken, so it gives uh, the drink a little more volume. Just crack it. Um, misplaced my Hawthorne strainer, but uh, just gonna use the glass shaker method. Oh, what am I doing? We want the ice in there. <laughs> there we go. So we're also gonna garnish the uh, margarita with a nice lime wedge. There we go. If you're blending, does that change the recipe at all? Um, you might want to add a little bit more uh, ice, but uh, not really. It's going to tend to be the same proportions and everything. Um, now, as for when you want to go for an alcoholic version, I would always say stick with either a silver tequila. So this is uh, fermented, distilled, and that's the product. They pull, a, they pull off the still. It's going to be a silver or, or a plata, it's also known as or a reposado. Reposado means rested. Um, it's aged for uh, no less than two months and no more than a year. So they're generally going to be closer to the two months just to produce more of the product. But um, depending on the flavor they want, uh, it's a, uh, rested aged in uh, oak barrels. Um, depending on the flavor they want, it might be aged longer. Um, and then there's the third uh, type of tequila, which is Añejo. It's uh, the age for at least uh, at least a year but no more than three you're going to want to stay away from that for your margaritas because uh, it's just a little pricey and uh, you want more of the really robust uh, agave flavors in your margaritas um, the añejos are really a lot more mellow and meant for sipping um, a uh, really common margarita you might hear about is a Cadillac margarita. And the primary difference between that and uh, just a margarita made with tequila, triple sec, and some citrus would be the float of Grand Marnier on top. Um, what I found to be an, extra, uh, an excellent margarita recipe built in a pint glass, or as this is a 14 ounce uh, margarita glass, would be uh, an ounce and a half of fresh lime juice, uh, three quarters ounce of your triple sec, uh, three quarter ounce of your simple syrup, 
and one and a half ounces of your choice of tequila. So, yeah. How much is a typical shot? Uh, it, it varies on where you're going, um, but a lot of times a shot will be between an ounce and an ounce and a half, but there's no industry standard. So um, saying, like giving things as a shot, saying a shot of this, a shot of that is not something we really do. We usually will do a, a, a ounce proportions. So um, it's important to keep, to scale your proportions. Uh, these can of course be made in, in pitchers for a party. You just have to appropriately scale the volume. So, yeah. Is everything? Well, thank you. Yeah, no, that's very nice. <laughs> yeah, I had to bring in an expert for that one because I have no idea what I'm talking about here. So, not yet. I'll wait. I'll wait till after the cameras are off. <laughs> so, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the vegetables now that they're caramelized. Um, basically, we have some nice color on our peppers here and our onions. Now we can mix these together, and we're gonna. Saute and we're going to add a little bit of the marinade, which is going to add some great flavor to this. And then we're going to mix, mix this together. A lot of the things that I've showed you here today, and what I really like about the ingredients that we're able to use here today is, um, I mean, we're starting to, the weather's starting to get warm, so, um, you know, a lot of stuff is not coming from Washington State, except, except for asparagus and some greens and spinach and things. But it's starting to move up the coast to us. And, you know, I always talk about 365, um, 365 degrees around me, 365 miles, work from within and out. Um, but even then, sometimes you're, we have to stretch those borders even a little further. But again, just walking through the grocery store and, and kind of smelling things and, and, and picking up, you know, and changing the menu uh, sometimes to what's available. I mean, there's been times where I've um, went to do a dessert and I, you know, I got some produce in or I was walking through a, a, a farmer's market and I saw some product and I was inspired. And like a lot of this actually was inspired from um, people I, I met and worked with in these, these recipes. Um, food is just should be an inspiration. And, um, but starting with quality ingredients and luckily here at WSU, we have our organics farm, our orchard. Um, Bradley was talking about our cattle ranch and they're starting to um, sell the WSU Wagyu beef. And our Wagyu beef is um, some of the best beef I've ever worked with in an industry. Um, I created the book, The Crimson Spoon. Um, with help from my students um, and WSU products. This showcases um, the organics farm, the orchard, the creamery, honey production, um, just all the different wheat research. Um, we're very fortunate to live here on the Palouse and have all the resources we do. Um, and it's getting warmer and May 5th is around the corner and, and this is a fun time to celebrate this menu too. Thank you.